Welcome today to tonight's first in the Thames Luminary series, a truly collaborative effort to celebrate our local history. Without further ado, I'll hand you over to the chair of the Thames Luminary series, lecturer and historian and just wonderful woman, Professor Judith Hawley. Thank you very much, Rachel, for your kind welcome. And thank you um, so much for all the work you've done to organise this series. I think, want to thank also uh, Robert Youngs, who's organised the, the ticketing, and all the many other people who've worked behind the scenes to make this possible. Some of you will um, have attended our previous series, the Twickenham Luminaries, and we've opened up to celebrate a much wider region. We're very aware that we live in a very special part of the world with so many beautiful historic sites. And I'm delighted too that there are now nine organisations who have joined together to bring you this series of talks. We're all desperate to connect with our audiences. We, we miss you greatly. And uh, we, we're, we're very aware that people, you must miss us because so many of you have, have come today and many of you also have very generously donated to our work. We, we can't wait to welcome you back when it's safe to do so. So I'd like to uh, introduce to you our speaker for the first of our series, Val Bott, and we're delighted to have her. She's a, she's a very popular and well-known speaker in the historian, uh, the cultural history circuit. She is a curator by profession and a local historian by enthusiasm. Her research on nursery gardens in the Thames Valley area, stretching from 1660 to 1860, and she's been developing that since 2006, and it's shared on nurserygardeners.com. She also edits the Brentford and Chiswick Local History Society's annual journal. She chaired the team which created a millennium statue of, of, of the wonderful William Hogarth and his equally wonderful pug, from which a registered charity, the William Hogarth Trust, was established in 2002. Its trustees are all practitioners, curators, art and garden historians, a conservator, and so on. And its primary work has been to support Hogarth's House with advice, creating exhibitions, giving talks, raising funds, and most recently, working in partnership on the Mulberry Garden Project, of which more later. Over to you, Val. Good evening. I'm delighted to be here with a lovely big audience and um, hoping I will enthuse you about Hogarth's House. We know a great deal about this apparently uh, modest garden and it's half an acre, and I'm aware that there is actually an hour's talk struggling to get out of the small, short time I have. I've therefore written a slightly more structured talk than I would normally do, and I've added a lot of captions to the slides so that you, the audience, have access to um, plenty of information. I know that it's a good story. It covers 150 years or so, and I hope you enjoy it. The talk's title refers to the space inside the wall. And here is the wall. Um, Richard and Susanna Downs obtained permission at the manorial court to enclose plots from the Chiswick Common Field in the 1670s. This is their wall. And it was a mixed orchard from which the mulberry tree may be the only survivor. Please remember the three gates. The watercolour by T.M. Rook from 1897 also shows the three gates. There is one close to the street lamp beside the house which gives access to the house itself. There is a small blocked gate and in this watercolour there's a sign above it for the nursery gardener who was running the plot at that time. And then there is a double gate and at the extreme right of the watercolour is the stable with a studio above which Hogarth used. Remember those three gates. I'm moving on to an extract from the 1890s Ordnance Survey map because it makes sense of what's inside the wall. The heavy line and closes the plot. And you can see along the top of this irregular triangle that there is a long straight path. The long straight path appears to be a very old path and it runs between the house on the right or the east 
and the building at the bottom of the garden, the stable or studio, um, which really is, is Hogarth's um, adaptation. This became Hogarth's retreat. The house was full of women. His wife, her mother, her cousin, and a family friend, and a lot of servants. And I think this was basically Hogarth's shed. You can also just make out on the map um, the diamond pattern um, of glass houses. There's a small glass house against the north wall in the Hogarth's house garden. And there is also a glass house in the neighboring garden, which appears in one of the images I shall show you. It's a little confusing. And then I've marked a tiny little square just at the bottom of the house plot, um, which is possibly a privy. We took the opportunity in 2010, 2011, when the house was being restored, to do some additional work. And this slide shows the double gates, which you saw in the first slide with very cheap feather edge fencing as their composition. And we took the diagonal timber and the green paint from the TM root watercolour, though not the crenellations along the top, I'm afraid. And we found the finials in the shrubbery in the garden. And they were brought out and cleaned and given new shoulders and reinstated in 2010. The double gate has become the level access from the street because the small gate by the house has two steps down. And for some people, those two steep steps are, are very difficult. So it, it opened up the garden in a different way in 2011. Now at the gate by the house are two spectacularly beautiful urns. These are actually um, replicas today. And it was a lovely piece of fundraising by one of our trustees, Rosalind Elliott, who died just before Christmas. But she rounded up theatrical contacts, an actor herself, and raised the money to make the replicas and we had a grant to restore the original urns, which hadn't been there since 1904. They're very nickable right beside your carriageway, so that's why we have the replicas. But they were a present from Garrick, seen in this silhouette with Hogarth. Um, I'm not quite sure what the gestures are that they're making, but he gave Hogarth urns, which were symbolic of fertility. Fabulous flowers and fruit around the shoulders of the urn and a pine cone on the top. Um, when he was older, Garrick wrote to Hogarth uh, with a humorous note saying that as his body grew and his stomach became more of a paunch, he began to resemble in profile Hogarth's line of beauty, which we will talk about later, the serpentine line. This etching by Hogarth is in the British Museum. There are several copies, one of which belonged to Horace Walpole. And we think this is Hogarth imagining his view across the common field to the house and garden he'd just bought. The shaded house, about a third of the way in, is Hogarth's house. And you can see the wall along the front of it. I'm going to just fade in a slight enlargement to make it easier to see. One copy of the print in the British Museum is labelled as, as Dr. Ramby's house. Ramby may have been the model for Hogarth's rake, but we think that house is the, the house on the left of this group, which faced Burlington Lane on the other side of the, uh, the gardens. Um, the shaded house is Hogarth's house, with the extension that Hogarth was planning. And you can see the small gate beside the house. You can see moving along a little way, the blocked gate that we still have today. And then the double gate with the little gable and a window in it of the stable with the studio above. It's a wonderful, useful image, little bit of artistic license. And you can just see on the far side, a little horse and cart arriving which is presumably Hogarth coming with his set of copper plates to work on in the studio. This watercolour from the 1840s um, shows you what remained of the stable with studio above in the early Victorian period. On the left is the glass house of the neighbouring plot, but within Hogarth's garden you have this slightly modified building the original stable had a little yard on the right, and that's been built over with 
um, a small extension with pantile roof. But you can see that the back of the stable building has a little hole in the wall with a plank with ribs and it also has a perching board and we think that it had been turned into a chicken shed um, by then. We're pretty sure that the stable was built at the same time as the house. When uh, Susanna Downs, the widow of the man who'd uh, devised the walled orchard in the 1670s, when she died in 1713, she left this half acre of land to her son and he built a house in the corner. And the people who took the first lease were the Ruperti family. Now she died in 1713. We don't know how quickly the building work started. The Downs family were bakers, they were not builders. But the Ruperti family were there by 1717. We have a gap in the rate books and 1717 is the first reference. However, we can show you a portrait of George Andrew Ruperti, a Lutheran pastor in the Savoy, who by 1717 was chaplain at the court of St. James's Palace. <coughs> Excuse me. We think he was chaplain to the German community rather than to the royal family. But he earned a lot of money by the 1720s when he was promoted. Um, he actually was earning £200 a year, which was a phenomenal fee. He acquired a second home in the country, in Chiswick, and this was the house that became Hogarth's house. When he died, he had given some of his library away already, but he asked that his library should be sold so that his young second wife and their small children would have some income. He had many classical and religious texts, um, some of which went to the chapel. The sale of his books took eight days. It was a phenomenal um, quantity of books, maybe why he was hard up and needing to sell the books for his widow. But all these books in the image are books that I found in the catalogue, which is in the British Library. All the major gardening books of the day were there. And he also had books on angling. So I think we can imagine what his spare time in Chiswick was spent on gardening and um, uh, fishing. His son was only five when his father died in 1732. And he had to wait until he was 21 before he could actually sell the property. By that time, Mrs. Ruperti was having great difficulty paying the rates and the rate books have notes about um, unpaid rates. And the Hogarths acquired the house in 1749. The um, house had been worth 10 pounds when the Rupertis took it over, the rateable value, but had declined to seven pounds when the Hogarths took it on. But when they enlarged it with a new room on each floor, then the value went up to £10 again. And although Hogarth died in 1764, members of the family were still there in 1808. So what did Hogarth do with the garden? It was a garden for relaxation, and there is a record that he played skittles or nine pins with his friends in the nut walk. This was a gentlemanly activity, played in pairs, and involved a lot of betting. Um, so you can imagine a great deal of fun being had. We have recreated a nut walk and a skittle ground, which will be in the garden when the house reopens. It was also a garden for food, fruit and vegetables, with the remnants of the um, Downs family's orchard and the mulberry. But it was also for play. The Foundling Hospital children stayed with the Hogarths in the summer, and Jane is said to have made mulberry pies for them. And in fact, the Foundling Hospital, which Hogarth helped to set up, um, used him as the superintendent of wet nurses who looked after the babies in Chiswick Parish. He oversaw their fees and the cost of clothing for the babies. And we've added some fan trained fruit trees, fruit trees in the garden so that um, the, the, uh, the visitors today will get a sense of the range of, of fruit that might have been grown. It was also a garden for the pleasure of plants. When Hogarth was describing his serpentine line of beauty, 
he produced two composite prints with all sorts of examples of what was good and what wasn't. And he included Lily and Iris to show the serpentine line. And these little images are cropped from that big print. And he wrote to John Ellis, a cloth merchant and botanist who'd sent him a present when he was away. And he actually thanks him for your pretty little seed cups or vases. Um, they are a sweet confirmation of the pleasure nature uh, seems to take in super adding an elegance of form to most of her works. And he offers to, in, in the spring, to sit down or even kneel down with Ellis and have a look at what grows from them. So Hogarth was interested in, in the plants. He also was a man who always had a dog at his heels, and this was obviously a garden for pets. Um, in this particular case, uh, we have two pet memorials to remind us of pets that they must have kept. Poor Dick, who died in 1760, died within Hogarth's lifetime, and loads of biographers have talked about him as a songbird, but Hogarth probably carved this stone himself. And there is the evidence that Dick is in fact a drake. There is his skull with the long bill and the crossed bones are a wishbone broken and crossed. The other memorial, however, dedicated to Pompey was installed long after Hogarth's death. Mrs. Hogarth long outlived him. She died in 1789, living with her slightly younger cousin, Mary Lewis. And I'm guessing that Mary Lewis installed this um, uh, uh, memorial. And it is probable that Pompey is named from a very fashionable novel about Pompey the Little. Hogarth would have despised the lapdog. He shows lapdogs in some of his pictures. Uh, some of his prints as a sort of scornful image but perhaps Mrs Hogarth was a bit sick of the pugs and rather liked having the little lap dog. After Mary Lewis died there was one other heir, the surgeon who looked after Hogarth and he lived, that he well he may have lived at the house or he may have let it but he had the house for a few years before his death and then in 1814, it was put up for sale. And so a range of new people arrived. The first one um, was a poet and critic, the Reverend Henry Francis Carey. He became curate at the parish church St Nicholas in Chiswick in 1814 and moved in with his family. And here we have the sale particulars which mention the excellent garden walled round, well planted, in which is also a fine walnut and a mulberry tree. And the coach, uh, the, the coach house or cart house and stable is described as a chaise house here. It's slightly gone up in the world. Carey was a rather um, mournful man. Um, he lost a daughter in 1807 and he lost another daughter in 1817 who he had been training up in languages and so on. His great skill was his translation of Dante, which was praised by Italians for the way he balanced the language with a, a poetic structure. In 1826, he became the assistant keeper of printed books at the British Museum. And that came with an apartment. Um, so he moved into town and let the house for a little while. We have no idea how the garden was used or quite how it operated, but he came back in the early 1830s uh, after a period of illness. In 1837, he expected to be promoted to keeper of printed books and he wasn't. I think the museum board probably felt because of his repeated illness and his depressive nature, he wouldn't have managed a more senior job. And he resigned and he wrote to the Times and said how unjust it was. He lived until 1844 and he's buried in Poets Corner in Westminster Abbey. So he was significant and he worked within a circle of writers and critics, which included people like Lamb and Hazlitt and De Quincey and Claire and Hood. And one of his great friends was um, one of the Rossettis, Gabriele Rossetti, whose children became um, 
well, they included um, Rossetti the painter and Christine the poet. So I guess this was a family house using the garden and then gradually it, uh, it moves on because the family that bought it in 1833 emigrated to Australia. We don't know all of the people who lived there in the 19th century, but we know it's a multiple occupation by using the census. One of the most interesting things is that this has turned out to be probably the oldest photograph we have of um, Hogarth's house. The little gate at the far left, the gate beside the house, if you enlarge the digitised picture, you can see the name of Mr. Clack on the gate. Um, Clack was related to the landlord of the nearby Feathers pub, and it looks as though he and his wife ran a small shop in the ground floor rooms. You will note that the house has two front doors now, one just to the left of the huge mulberry and one at the extreme right in Mrs. Hogarth's kitchen. Um, we don't know quite how the house was divided up or how the staircase was shared, but the garden is looking a bit scrubby except for um, the, the, the fabulous mulberry tree. However, um, the Clacks um, were running their business. Mr. Clack died um, sometime around uh, 1880 and Mrs. Clack took over. And in the 1881 census, she's described as a dairy woman and pig keeper. And she appears in a composite illustration in the Daily Graphic in 1874, coming away from having fed her pigs in the corner by the stable studio above and you can just make out on the far wall there are the two pet memorials. Sadly they don't survive but we're going to put back replicas as part of the refurbishment. The other part of the house was occupied by the Coles family. George Coles is in the census in 1881 as a gardener and florist uh, florists at that time usually meant that he specialised in flowers rather than that he ran a flower shop. And this rather fine print from Old and New London shows the huge mulberry in winter with no leaf. And on the left you can just see the small glass house that had been installed with a, possibly a coal frame on the right. And you can see in the distance on the left the small gate with the urns on the gateposts. He had a wife and three small boys, so it was probably quite a riotous place. And Mrs. Clack had a daughter who was seven in 1881, so I'm not sure she would have been happy with a three or four and a five year old racing about. In 1890, um, their neighbour, Alfred Dawson, a specialist printer, bought the house and spent quite a, a time doing it up and researching it. And he let it to his neighbour from nearby Paxton Road, another gardener and florist, in this case, John Allgrove. And he's seen here in this photograph with his new young wife and probably a, a, a family relative. There's some wonderful seats in the garden. So I think he was living in the house and using it as his home and growing runner beans against the north wall. But the foreground, in the foreground, there are rows and rows of geraniums. And I guess that's probably part of his business. Over the southern wall, Alfred Dawson rented him part of his own huge garden of a house called the Cedars. So he would have had rather a good business in the 1890s. Sadly, Around 1900, the house was going to be put up for sale. All around it, new streets of houses were appearing. The nursery gardens and market gardens of Chiswick were disappearing under the plots of, of housing. And a group of local people got together to see if they could raise the money to buy the house and turn it into a museum. They raised just over 450 pounds out of the 1500 they thought would be the, the asking price. But interestingly, the auctioneer, Curry & Co, advertised the house as being suitable for um, philanthropists and members of the artistic world to form um, a Hogarth Museum. The night before the auction, William Shipway's wife said to him, you could buy that, darling. And he got onto his lawyer, 
And the next day at the auction, he bought Hogarth's house for £1,500. He restored it and opened it to visitors. He bought prints. He commissioned replicas of furniture in Hogarth's prints to furnish the house from the Chiswick Art Workers Guild. And after five years of running it for the public, he, sold, he, he gave it as a charitable gift to Middlesex County Council. We know what the garden looked like soon after that time because an artist called Jesse McGregor was painting watercolours for a planned exhibition of gardens of celebrities. But when the war broke out in 1914, she turned this into a project which researched the gardens and created a book. And her book was published in 1918 and it was called Gardens of Celebrities and Celebrity Gardens. It, it's rather fine, it includes Chiswick House and various other West London gardens as well. A recent article by Leanne Newman in the latest issue of Garden History reveals that this layout was done by Madeleine Agar, who worked for the Metropolitan Parks and Gardens Association and was commissioned by Middlesex County Council. So by 1913, we have a rather arts and crafts style garden. The old path survives, running from the stable come studio straight down to the house. You can see a white patch on the wall on the left, which was the whitewash where the small glass house had been as a lean-to on the wall. And the beds are filled with Hogarth's line of beauty irises and little box hedges. And then under the mulberry tree, which is hidden by young trees that have been added, you can see spring daffodils. The trees down the right of the path grew to an enormous size and were infected with fungus and were too close together. And I'm afraid we saw them down about five years ago, but it made a huge difference to this area of the garden because they were so overwhelming. And we've used some of the ideas from this garden um, in, the, in the new planting. We don't have a lot of information about the 20th century custodians, but the Didims family were there from 1935 to 40. And quite by chance, members of the family turned up in 2011 and shared some of their family snapshots with us. Uh, it was two of the children who had grown up in the garden in the 1930s, now in old age. They gave us a photograph of Albert and Edith Didham's, their parents, standing here with the north wall in the background and you can just see the houses across the lane which at that stage was not six lanes of traffic um, Albert and Edith he worked as a mental health nurse having had a role at Chiswick House's asylum for a while and then went to work at the workhouse for the union workhouse for the area and Edith was the custodian who opened the house to the public Esther in the picture on the left, surrounded by irises with her toy horse in the background, sadly died after they'd left the house in 1942. But here are Edith and Albert in 2011, named after their parents. She was born in 1934, he was born in 1936, and the snapshot shows them with their sister Esther. A, a, what was called a parachute mine, fell in Hogarth Lane about 100 yards away in 1940 and did very serious damage to the house. They were sheltering in the cellar and they talked movingly about this experience. Their father was on night duty and came back to find the damaged house and no family. But they moved to Bennett Street across the lane and they spent all their life in Chiswick. My final few slides are about the Mulberry Garden Project, where the William Hogarth Trust and the Hogarth House Trust of which Hounslow Council is the main uh, trustee, we've been working together on a project. Having restored the house in 2010-11, we've been trying to restore the garden. This view from the small gate by the house shows work in progress. In the distance is a modern glass building with an elegant foyer whose front wall is Hogarth's Serpentine Line of Beauty. And it's going to be called the Western Studio after the main sponsor, um, the, uh, the Western Foundation. You can see the mulberry tree is much less 
um, lofty than in the old photographs because it too was bombed. So we have the bottom of the trunk and everything else is post-war growth, nurtured by gardeners from Kew in the 1940s. From the other end, you can see how the garden is reflected in the glass of the new building, which will be used for events and learning and functions. And it, the, the reflection minimizes the sense of the new building in the garden, but from inside the new building, you are just aware of the garden all the time. This view from where the stable once stood looks back towards the house. You can just make out in the studio, the learning studio on the right, the fabulous timber structure which resembles trees inside the building. And then the low building to the left of it is the foyer that would let you into a, an evening event. The arch structure is the most wonderful artist blacksmith's um, nutwalk um, su supporting um, device. And it has little iron mob leaves to decorate it. And in the ground in front of you, just to the left, there's a little bit of the brickwork which marks out the stable footings to show where the building was. We did some archeology span to define exactly what, what, what it was. The um, hazel saplings along the nut walk have been given by the family of Hazel Conway, a parks and gardens historian in her memory. And gradually they will grow up over the structure and make an elegant arch of leaves. My final image shows you a panoramic view from the site of the stable with the new glass house on the left, the wall of the Bothy where the volunteer gardeners will work and the uh, nut, walk, nut walk in the middle, work, walk, you know, wending its way towards the structures. There have been lots of delays but everything's taking shape and once the pandemic has become more manageable you'll be able to see the beautiful garden, the craft commissions and hopefully it will open later in 2021. Thank you for joining. I'll be very happy to answer questions and I hope you'll come and visit. Thank you, Val. That was really splendid. I, I, that was just fascinating. It's, it's, a, it's a wonderful project um, and I can't wait to, to, to visit. I'm sure lots of us have had our appetites whetted by that. I